How big is your God? What do you think that can happen as people band together and are empowered by the Spirit of God? If your first time today, man, welcome to Crossroads. We have, uh, you've stepped into a doozy. We're in the midst of uh, the six most important weeks in our church's 28 year history. I'm in the six most important weeks of my personal life. We are looking and working towards bringing an awakening, something to our land that rattles our cages, gets us off of our phones, gets us out of our doldrums, shakes us out of depression, helps us see the way of hope instead of the way of anxiety, and connects people to a life-giving relationship with God, and has all the trickle-down effect that comes with it. I'm going to talk about that right now, and let's pray before I go any further, all right? God, you are really, you are, you are, you're big, you're very big, and you are empowering, and you're also patient, and you're kind. Be patient with people like us that sometimes are just two heads down and too thick. Be helpful to me as I try to communicate to your people and be helpful, and may all of us, God, have our hearts inclined more towards you, and I pray these things according to the character and identity of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're in week two of our push. By push, the reason it's called a push is because we're going to be pushing on you. And I'm going to push on you tonight. Are you, uh, today, are you ready to get pushed? I'm going to push you a little bit. Just like a little nudge. Just going to give you a little push. Just going to give you a push. I believe you came to Crossroads today because you want something more from where you could be other than here. When you came in today or when you left yesterday, you got one of these guys. It's one of the things we're doing to give us a, a fully orbed, multi-sensory tactile journey over the next six weeks or actually from now on over the next five weeks. I want to push you into new territory. We want to push each other to new levels of spiritual growth. We want to push us closer to the, to the heart of God. We want to push our community closer to the potential that it has to be a blessing to the world and actually bring God's kingdom, God's preferred way of living, not just in heaven, but bring it into earth. Jesus talks about this kingdom again and again and again and again, and he does all he can to talk to his people to help them understand God's plan for our life and how we should and can be living differently. To do this, he would use stories, he would use parables. He didn't have screens and hazers and that stuff. He used what he could in the countryside, which was stories, also known as parables. Stories he made up, but they're meant to have a point. I'm going to read one for you today. It's one that's repeated multiple times in the Bible, which means the biblical authors and consolidators saw it as really important. I'm going to read the version out of the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 3. And here we go. Jesus says, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside just lost my way. Excuse me. There it is. Some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the rain came and when the sun show, shone, they rose and were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. She who has ears to hear, let her hear. Jesus is sort of a master of tension and drama. He tells these stories, and most of the time, he doesn't explain them. Like one of the classic ones of the prodigal son, We've told here a number of times, two sons, one son is rebellious, another one is an older son, is not rebellious, and the father runs the rebellious son, I'm not going to tell you the whole thing, but Jesus doesn't explain it to us. So the, the meaning is pretty similar, but that's part of why every time you read it, you can see something different, because he allows our imagination to go with it. This is one of the very few parables where Jesus actually tells us the meaning. He tells us what the point is. There are... Four types of people, according to Jesus, four types of people in this world. Those who can count and those who can't. Four types of people in this world. 
he, he refers to them, he refers to us rather as the, as the four soils. And there's a, there's a, there's a sower who, who represents God and God has seed and the seed represents the word of God, the truth of God. And God is going around, and I know some of you ladies are gonna hate it, but get over it. God goes around, God goes, you want that, you want that right there, James. Bam, right for you. God, God goes around and he just puts out his truth. Hey, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Hey, I am, I am a God of compassion. I am a God of forgiveness. This is the way that life works. He goes out sowing his seed all over the place and how it lands, the kind of person it lands on will have four different reactions. And our reaction is based on the heart that we have, the heart that has been cultivated. You can throw out truth all you want, but if it doesn't land on a heart that wants to receive it and is ready to receive it, then it doesn't mean anything at all. Let's hear from Jesus who these soils are, what they represent. I have them represented over here right now. Let's just, let's just read what he says. Let's have him dummy proof it. Here's what he says. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes down and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what is sown on the path. So here we have the path. And it's, it's, it's really hard. It's, it's batted down because people are walking on it all the time. It's, it's smushed down. It's, you know, all the traffic. It's, it's, it's hard. And the, and the seed falls on there, but it, it can't go anywhere. Nothing takes place. Why does nothing takes place? It's because there is an evil one who's very hungry. That evil one's known as Satan, the devil, the adversary, the deceiver, all different kinds of names for him that are in the Bible. And what he does is when we hear something that's truth, hear something that's God, before it sinks into our heart and transforms us, he comes down and takes it away. He snatches it away before it gets down inside of our heart. This is sort of what cynicism does. Cynicism is a condition where it doesn't matter what hits you. You're like, oh, I, don't, I don't know if that's true. I, I, yeah, really? I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I mean, cynics, cynics are really, really bothered by, by, by this, this push right now because cynics think that the moonshot was a hoax. Cynics are always looking for a conspiracy. Cynics are always feeling like someone isn't being truthful. Someone isn't saying what needs to be said. It's really, really weird. I know people, I know people who have been big UFO people for a long, 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 long time. Until when? You know until when? Until the government came out about a year or so ago and said, yeah, there's some stuff we're discovering. We don't understand. Probably there's UFOs. And then these same people went, oh, there's no UFOs. Can't be any UFOs. No, they always got to be contrarians. If no one believes it, I believe it. If someone believes it, if the authority says it, no, 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 I, no, I, I don't believe it. This is, this is the way of cynicism. It's, it's, it's the way of our world. Always believe there's a hidden agenda. Always believe you're not being told the truth. Always believe something is odd. And therefore, it's virtually impossible to have a communal experience in a church because you have cynics who always believe there's some agenda that the church has that they're not telling you. And there's always some super secret thing that you don't know. Friends, that's just not true. This, it's, just, it's just not true. It is exhausting to live in this world of cynicism. In fact, this cynicism is what's in our country. People are cynical about anything on the right, anything on the left says. People are cynical about science, or maybe that person isn't doing true science, cynical about the news, whatever it is. And then we hear the word of God and we're immediately cynical again. Well, I, I don't know, is that, is that really Jesus' in words? I don't care that Christ falls or bleed for 2,000 years and we have older documents, uh, original, not original documents, but a few decades after his death and than any other ancient antiquity. I don't, I don't care. I don't care that's proven the, a book that has transformed lives and skeptics have come to embrace him. I don't know. I, I, I don't even know. That. How do we know it's true? I don't know. And it's just, friends, it gets exhausting and it doesn't get us anywhere. If we don't, if we don't trust something at some time, we have nothing to stand on and we'll never go forward in our life, let alone with our faith. Now, as I talk about this, I'm talking a bit about myself. You're going to have, when you go through this, I hope you've been going through it. How many have been going, going through our guide so far this last week? It's pretty awesome, huh? 
A little show of hands, a little applause. Come on, it was really good. What you're going to do this week, in, in addition to the, the really good discussion things that are in there and the self-reflection things, is there's a test for you. There's a test for you to understand which of these soils do you trend to. And the good soil, which is in the end, I'm just going to tell you now, you're not going to be able to test that one. Sorry, everyone thinks they're good soil. It's a rig test. You're not going to, all of us have one of these three things, even if we're good soil, that I'll get to in a minute, all of us have one of these three things that's our Achilles heel, that speaks to us, that nags at us. And my, my Achilles heel of these three, uh, I, think I, I think I have a, a screenshot of my results, is cynicism. It is this, it's cynicism. You know, I, I just, uh, I have a hard time sometimes believing that everything that I'm being told is what's right. I have a hard time believing that people are, are sincere. I understand it, and maybe that's why you reap what you sow, and I get punished with my own issues. This last week, I was at the, uh, at the revival. Any revival folks in here at any of our sites? Yeah, a bunch of you. Come on, jeez. So I went out and I camped out the night before the revival on Friday and I camped out on Friday. I had some friends with me because we were preparing things, getting stuff ready and all that. And we're, as we're sitting around the campfire, having some beers, we're talking. And, and my friend said, uh, they said, you know, <laughs> people find out that I'm your friend. And I always get the same question. They all said this, like, what, what's the question? They said, they said, people always go, what's BT really like? What's he really like? And they go, you ever... This is what they say. They say, uh, you, ever, you ever see him on stage? They go, yeah. He's exactly like that. <laughs> exact, exactly like that. And it came up because I had, uh, I do this uh, multivitamin drink called AG1, and I was, you know, I was drinking. I have it even when I'm, even I'm, the way I'm doing it. I, it's on, they sponsor the podcast that I do. And, and people, people are going, like, he doesn't actually drink AG1. And they see me on a camping trip in the middle of nowhere pulling out my thing. That's what reminded them. I'm like, no, no, no. If he says he does it, he actually does it. Maybe it's because we see very few people have their words match their life. Maybe if that's, that's our problem. Maybe our problem is we have shame because my words don't match my life. So certainly nobody else's words can match their life. Whatever the reason is, it's still the same root cause. There's an evil one who wants to pluck away the truth of God. We want to see the truth of God get into 10 times as many lives as it's getting into right now through our church. 10 times as many. That's what we want to see. We feel led there by God. And to do that, we've seen that there's four territories, if you will, four areas that we have a disproportional impact on. Four of them. And they're not the ones you might think. Um, one of these territories is not preaching. I'm a capable preacher. Kyle is as well. Others are Chuck. Others are as well. But like, no one's inviting us to conferences to speak. I love our music. It's great music. It's, it's awesome. It's awesome. And we can't, get a, we can't buy a hit on Spotify or YouTube. <laughs> Other churches can. We can't. For it. And I like the music. I, I don't understand. It's really, really good. Maybe great. But we're not having a real impact in terms of our music and our messages in ways that we are in four other areas, four territories, if you will, that sort of our ground, ground that God has given us, ground that we can have a unique contribution in. And we're going to look at just one of that territory tonight because it actually relates to our soils. Let's look at the territory of camps. In the book of Isaiah, God's call to think bigger and push for more is clear. Enlarge the place of your tent is an exhortation to expand the territory God has already given us, the place where the favor of God has collided again and again with the gifts He's put in all of us, producing supernatural results. Over the last 28 years, we have taken a lot of ground for the kingdom of God, but there are four territories that God has clearly given us where we have seen His favor to go farther than we could ever have dreamed possible, and where He is now calling us to not hold back, to say yes to taking a 10x moonshot, to seeing His kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Through inspiring camps, we're seeing spiritual, emotional, and relational breakthroughs. Crossroads camps are only in class, and we believe God wants us to take things even further. 
our focus is adding new features and better experience to reach more people, with plans to add a 20-acre lake, signature experiences like a music festival for 18 to 24-year-olds, capacity for tens of thousands of people per event, and spaces to minister to the core group of volunteer leaders within Crossroads that fuels this ministry. With 770 acres of land, we believe Base Camp could be ground zero for a spiritual awakening. So at 18, I enlisted in the Army. About halfway through basic training, I got what's called a Red Cross message, which is a family emergency. Immediately called my mom, and uh, she informed me that my uncle was murdered. I remember feeling alone. Basic training is not the, the place to show your emotions. It's not the place to feel those things. So I just kind of bottled it down inside. Uh, I was very angry. Um, confused, hurt. I came home after basic training, started drinking very heavily. I knew something was, was happening with PTSD when I started experiencing some pretty bad nightmares. Rock bottom was, I didn't think there was anything else for me. So I attempted to take my life. My, my roommate found me and um, said, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna go to church with me. We're gonna get you connected to some form of community. Uh, it was Crossroads Uptown. Went there, got plugged into an awesome small group. Ended up uh, signing up for college camp. Had a great experience there. But I was still dealing with a lot of things that I was not, at the time, willing to bring to light. That came up in nightmares. It came up in the shadow in the corner of the room. In every single crowd I walked into, there, there'd be a threat. I took the PTSD screening, 30 being the low end, 80 being the high end, and I scored a 78. The predominant thing that it stemmed from was the death of my uncle, but I really felt like God was going to meet me at man camp. Camping around a fire, talking about what's actually going on in our lives. That was like the first time that I had really opened up to someone other than my therapist about what was going on. I felt seen, I felt heard. So I decided to go to the prayer tent because I was just going to model it for my group. <laughs> I had no expectations for myself and I spilled my guts. <laughs> I, I told him everything about my PTSD diagnosis, the suicide attempt, I told him everything. But then he asked to pray for me. I tried to do this without crying. Um, he asked to put his hands on my head and he started praying this prayer to heal the neurons and the neurological pathways in my brain that were hyperactive because of the PTSD. He said, Lord, just allow Brandon's brain to work the way that you intended it to work, to go back to its original purpose. And I remember looking up while he was praying and his, his hands weren't there. I asked him, when did you take your hands away? He said, soon after I started. I said, well, I still feel hands under my hat, moving through my hair. I, I still feel these warm, comforting hands on my head. And I just looked up and I felt the breeze for the first time, felt like in forever. I just felt lighter, felt comfort, I felt loved. And then he asked me if there was anybody I wanted to forgive. <laughs> and. Um, I said, I, I think I need to forgive the man that murdered my uncle. And I did. And I you know, didn't realize how much hate I'd been holding in my heart for a man I'd never met. And I uh, just felt light. Well, a week later after man camp, I, I went to my therapist and you know, I, I'd like to take the PTSD screening again. I took the test and I no longer qualified. I think the score was 10. It felt incredible to feel God's presence and just know that He has, one, been with me the whole time, and He wanted to heal me. I just had to ask for it. It makes me feel grateful that a lot of people have gone before me to give their time, 
money, energy into uh, the camps so that I could come to a place to experience a miracle, uh, experience um, a new life. I see hope for a future, my tithe and my finances. I want to keep pouring those things into camps so that somebody like me can experience what I experienced. Man, oh my gosh, that's so good. Wow, wow. There's something magical that happens when you get on our land and we get out of buildings. At our camps, we don't have any Crossroads logos. It's not Crossroads branded. It, we just want to touch people and not put anything else in their way. And there are some crazy healings that have been happening. Now, healings are known as miracles because they don't happen a lot. Don't think that if you do the right hocus pocus prayer, then you're going to have one. Don't get bitter if you don't have one because they're called miracles because they don't happen that often. But I'll tell you what, some of us in here, we listen to that story and we go like, oh, come on, really? Really? I don't know. I think he just probably had an, a good day when you retook the test. I think it's just his emotions. Really? Where, where the, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If that's your thinking, that's exactly why you don't pray. That's exactly why you don't have answers to your prayers. Because you don't believe. You have a hard heart. You got just and soft enough of a heart to actually call yourself a Christian, barely. But when's the last thing you ask God for? You probably don't ask him for anything because you're cynical he would do anything. Billy Graham said, heaven is full of answers to prayers to which no one bothered to ask. The first night at the revival, I had everybody take 30 seconds, just ask God something. With well, a simultaneous thing went on. A mother uh, told us that her 15-year-old son, for the first time, asked God for something he hasn't been able to smell or taste for, I think it was four years since he had COVID. And he just asked in that tent and boom, nostrils opened up, he could smell everything in the tent. It was amazing. At any point, you can applaud for this. This stuff is real. This stuff is real. We need to see that being the police that finds something wrong with things is not a spiritual gift. It's a curse. It comes from the evil one. That's what he does. He finds things that are wrong with you and makes sure he points it out. He finds things that are wrong in the world and he taints it and he hurts it. And so when we are always looking to find something wrong, to find the hidden meaning and be, friends, we're not, you're not helping yourself. You're not, we're just, we're just hardening our heart. That's cynicism. By the way, this is one of the, one of the cooler stories. Uh, because we had people from all different places, not just part of Crossroads that came to the Bible, we had about, we're guessing about 8,500 people over the course of two days come. And uh, one, we came in on, yeah, that's where I was very cool. We had, uh, we, we thought, the cynical me, and many of us around here thought, you know, we're going to have a Friday night thing, a Saturday night thing. Weekend service is going to be really limping and lame. And it's the beginning of the push. That's a bummer. And we said, well, uh, whatever. We're just going to serve God any way we can. Oh, stupid us. We had a growth spurt last weekend. After people out Friday night, Saturday night, we had a 15% growth spurt on Sunday. People didn't just stay away. They said, no, I want, I want more of God. Last weekend, this uh, 70 year old Pentecostal pastor came to one of our sites and he, he at, went to the Welcome Center and he asked for forgiveness. He said, I'm a 70 year old Pentecostal pastor and I need to confess, I need to repent that I've had a bad attitude towards this church. I've never been here. I just assumed it was big and just was not giving truth. And what I experienced, the revival, blew me away. I just came here to say, I'm sorry. I need to repent to somebody. And he said, and then he said, would, would it be okay if I just sat in the back rows for a few weeks just to kind of sit here? Of course, of course. That's a tender-hearted man. You can change soil, Okay. That's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is God. The point of the parable is God. No matter what your soil is, the point is God keeps giving you more. God keeps giving you another shot. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to cultivate our heart. The next one Jesus talks about is the rocky soil. Let's, wait. Let's just get the opinion from him. What does the rocky soil mean? He says this, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. 
Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the, of the word, immediately he falls away. So you put some seed in here and you're going to get some growth. But because there's no root structure, as soon as sun comes, it withers up and it dies. So this appears to be a person of faith. But as soon as difficulty comes, it dies away. You could liken this to fragility. To someone who has a very fragile faith. Uh, It could be, uh, it could be, uh, I had a health issue or my loved one had a health issue and God didn't heal me, so forget God. Really, it's a fragile situation. All the greats in the Bible had horrible things happen to them. That's why they're the greats. Horrible things happen to them. Many of them didn't get resolved. But they persevered because they had roots. When we get, when we get upset because something in our way, we're just, we're just tipping or telling everybody, hey, I'm rocky soil. I have no roots. I have no depth to my faith because I can't handle it. Or reject the word. Like the number of people who have left Crossroads because we actually say something in the Bible and someone doesn't like it and they don't want to be here. That's what he says, the word. I, I love people. I love people who aren't heterosexual. We have people in our church who aren't heterosexual. And, uh, and uh, we're for all people. And God has a, a design that he's very clear on with sexuality, very clear on. And the people I've met who just had their, heart, their, their face shipwrecked over that is crazy to me. In other words, you want them to be in step with what everyone else believes in culture. You don't want to be in step with God. And Jesus talks about this, that we've got to have roots to where we get persecuted. And if we get persecuted, we stand because we have roots. Man, I know, I've known some amazingly charismatic Christians who fall away. And by charismatic, I'm talking about big personality. I'm talking about winning smile. But man, as soon as hard times come, gone. Gone. Man, I, I've known people who've been Bible scholars and could beat me in Bible trivia. But something comes up, scorching wind they can't have, boom, gone. Because they look good, they've got the word, there's no roots, there's no depth. Mile wide on knowledge, on personality, on smiles and stories, but an inch deep in terms of, in terms of root structure, not good. The third soil that, that Jesus talks about is the thorny soil. Let's, let's read what the thorny soil is. As for that which was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. The thorny soil, has just, there's a lot going on here, isn't it? Like this one's pretty barren. This one's got nothing. There's a, there's a lot going on here because there's a, there's a lot of distractions. A lot of things that are popping up all over the place. And what happens with this is when something starts to seed, something starts to pop up, it gets choked out because there's too much going on. This actually, in many ways, is a picture of America. Everyone has a different agenda for what America is supposed to be. Everyone's going in a different direction. And we're all choking out one another. We've never been more polarized than this. And it, it, it affects our faith. It affects our relationship with God. One of the great things about the space program was even though there was some dissenters who said, hey, we're spending a lot of money. It's a good conversation to have. We're spending a lot of money. There's probably some things we can do here in our own country rather than try to get some rocks in the moon. It was a really good voice. It's a really good debate to have. You can, you, can, you can be a voice that wants to have some discussion and not be a bad person, not be a cynic. No, no problem with that at all. But the great thing as you look back in that history, which by the way, I was there. I was there. I'm old enough to be there. I had it in, in preschool. We all came into preschool. Mrs. Wagaman. We all came in. She's the person who's taught me to read. I, I can remember clear as day sitting on her lap and seeing C spot run. Like the words were coming off the page. It was blowing me away, right? So we're there and, and they roll, roll out this little 19 inch black and white TV, about the size of Kyle Ransom. They roll it out to him. Yeah, I heard Kyle cracking on my age. Yes. Yes, I am older than you, and I actually was there when we walked the moon. I remember all of us in the class, we all came around and stared at this grainy TV. This, by the way, was before the days of cable. You had these long things called rabbit ears. 
You would take it and you would extend it up and you'd have people go like this on them and they put tinfoil on them and someone was always going about hitting the TV. That was back when America was America. It was, it was crazy back then. It was, it was a wild, wild west. And we all sat there in awe as we could barely tell what was happening on the, on the screen. But all of America did that. JFK's vision of going to the moon brought us together. We were focused on one thing. We were unified on one thing. Kind of what happened if you're old enough to remember Desert Storm, the first good thing our military did after Vietnam. It focused our country. We, brought, we came together. We were a bit less fragmented, fragmented for a moment. With 9-11, it focused us. This thorny, all these thorns, it just distracts. There were so many distractions today. I'll just, people talk about these all the time. This is not, nothing here is new for you. It's just highlighting how Jesus' truth is still true. It's just different tools. Our social media feeds. I mean, I don't, shoot, man. I, don't, I refuse to look at how much screen time I have every, every week on my iPhone. Nope, not going to look at it. Nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. Too depressing. The amount of things on our news feed, our social media, the, the, the jibber jabber that we have on things, the, the paranoia and fixation we have on politics that we can't change it at all. You know who you're going to vote for. So is the next person. Yeah, we're fixated on it. Stop, relax. If we read the Bible a little more and watched our news feed a little bit less, you might have some more cool stuff popping out of your life. Distraction, getting into the cares of the world. We see it everywhere. So last week heading into the revival, I was really on a, on a high. I was getting in the zone. I was, uh, I was a bit more bold than normal. I, I fasted a couple, couple days last week just to get clear. And um, in the middle of that fast, I went to work out, which is always difficult to go work out when you have nothing in your stomach. But I said, why not? Let's just do it. Just two days. Jesus went 40. I can do two. So I went in there. I went in and, uh, and as I was, uh, I was working out, uh, a guy I know came up. Uh, used to be a professional athlete, comes up and he says, hey, he's sweating. I'm sweating. How you doing? I don't know what to talk. And I just had a level of, uh, of boldness in me that I don't normally have because I was almost on a spiritual high. And, and I said, hey, man, I haven't seen you at church for a while. Where you been? And he goes, oh, well, I, I, I go to different churches. I go, he started naming all these churches. Little did he know, I know all them and know their pastors. Oh, so-and-so, you see so and so And as he was talking, I just said, let's keep pushing. So I'm going to push in these days. I said, are you, are you as committed to your faith as you were to your football training? Do you put as much energy into growing your faith as you put into football? He said, uh, definitely not. So that's a problem. The problem. I didn't say this, but I'm saying now, football comes and goes. Any, anything you put time in is going to come and go. Your career, it's going to go. It's going to go away. Your spouse... They may die before you. They go away. Every, anything you put time into, anything you put energy, as valuable and as good as it is, it's going to go away. The one thing that's not going to go away is your relationship with God. And yet, we use it, look at it so lackadaisically. Like, okay, if, if I got nothing else going on, I'll go there. One of the cool stories I got from the, from the uh, so many of them, because they keep coming in, flooding in from the revival, is uh, a young family said it was my son's first time to have an indoor lacrosse game. And they said, no, you're not going to go play indoor lacrosse. We're not going to have sports rule this family. Uh, we're going to revival as a family. And God showed up and brought their family together. And then the kid's like, Dad, I don't want to go to practice tomorrow. Can I, go, can I, can I come back here on Saturday? When's the, when's the last time you chose God over anything else that you always choose? What's the, la what's the last time you said, no, that's a distraction. That's a distraction. God's my priority. Can you identify a time? Well, you chose God over something else that was a good option. If you have a hard time doing that, this might be your Achilles heel. This. See, it's not, it's not what we say. It's not what we intend. It's not what we believe. It's what we do. It's what we do. This uh, is part of the story of a, of a couple women who's, uh, whose hearts I find really impressive. We were both incarcerated together. 
at Dayton Correctional. We became each other's support system. We used to go to Crossroads Church inside of the prison, and I remember watching Brian, the one and sermon where they're training the horse. I'm like, man, this is the coolest church ever. Somebody that I work with was like, oh, well, I go to Crossroads. I say, yeah, I'll go with you. So then I dragged music along with me. Started out one Thursday. I go one Thursday, and it ended up every Thursday. We've been going for a couple of months now. Four seven and has a plan to try to put Crossroads in every single prison across America. Do you think that that's worthwhile? Yes. Yes. The way that the word is brought about, it's more relatable. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm just talking to you or I'm just talking to you, but yeah, it, it gets filled up with God. And like, I used to go to the um, different denominational churches and stuff, but they were like, you can't dye your hair. You can't. And then here comes Crossroads. Like, we love you just the way you are. You're, like, God doesn't make mistakes. You're perfect just the way you are. But Yeah, and in DCI though, like, not a lot of people like the main church in DCI, so Crossroads is their church. In prison, people, they always say they got you coming home. They'll give you paperwork after paperwork after paperwork saying, hey, this is out there for you, and it's not. Crossroads 4-7 is the only program that has been real. And I've been in and out of prison my whole life. God's really showed up for me. Like, I never um, make right choices in life, and I feel like he has, like, paved a path for me to follow. He literally, like, gave us a loaner car, let us go to work every day, put me on the wheels program. It's just amazing. Like, there's things that God has done for me in literally three months that I could have never done for myself. I remember being in prison and like really diving deep with my relationship with God. And one of the scriptures that I've always held on to is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's got me this far, he's not gonna drop off now. I did get to experience it. I cried and cried and cried, it was so beautiful. It was just like we wasn't in prison for a minute. That's one of the first times that I really felt like genuine love from the Christian community. Life-changing experience. Now that we're out here, she's like, oh, FYI, they're doing women's camp and we're going. I said, okay. As soon as we're walking in, I'm like, this, this, isn't, this isn't for me. Like, they, these people are different than me. <laughs> but Sarah Lynn's like, no, 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 we're all the same. We got this. So she's been a great support. But yesterday really opened my eyes to what love and non-judgmental is. Like, people are very kind. Well, let me ask you this. So we're going to take Women Camp back again to DCI. Would you want to come with us? If they would if they let, let us, us in, yeah, they, they might not let me in. <laughs> I've been there too many times. If they let me in, I'm going. I would go for sure. And what message would you take to the women there? There's hope on the outside. Prison does not define who you are. No matter how many times you've been there, no matter how much comfortable it is, it's not your identity. Music said something that was very damning to those of us who are Christians. She said, people come in and they say it all the time. We're going to be there for you. We have the brochures. She said it, but they never are. And fortunately, she found out that one little corner of the kingdom is, and that's this place called Crossroads, just using her, her words. And, you know, the good soil here, the good soil, the good soil isn't about having the right ideas, having the right, the right beliefs having the right intentions, having the right emotions. 
I mean, we have rooms full of people who have good beliefs, good emotions, look good, all that stuff. Doesn't mean you have good soil. It's not about what you think, what you do, what you feel, what you believe, though those things are good in as much as they lead us to do something. That's what Jesus is saying, to do something. More stuff popping up. There's nothing coming out of this, but the good soil stuff can start popping up. And it's crazy that the cynics, when they look at something that's growing and it's big, like our community, think something is wrong. No, something is wrong if you're not growing according to Jesus. We're calling this 10X. I, I quite frankly feel like I have to tell God I'm sorry because he doesn't even give 10X as a possibility. He says 30, 60, 100X. 30, 60, and 100X. How big's your God? How many, how many musics do you think God can get a hold of? How, how much do you think God can use you in your life? Are you in that? Can you identify the last person you shared your faith with? Can you identify the last person you prayed for? Can you identify who it is that would look at you and say, that person's making my life better? That's what Jesus is saying. That's the indication of a good heart of a heart that opens and receives the word of God because they do something instead of finding what the hidden agenda is, instead of flaming out as soon as things get tough or just go, oh, where is it? Oh, a squirrel, a little squirrel. Look at that over there. I think that's why we're here as a church. Uh, we're here, whatever it is, to just say yes to God. Say yes, 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 yes. And a lot of things we've said yes and we've done, they failed. But it's because on the front end, we said, yes, yes, yes. That's what a follower of Jesus does. That's what someone who wants to come to Christ says. You say, yes, Jesus, yes, I want your grace. Yes, I want that forgiveness. If that music can get forgiven, she's done worse things than me. Yes, I want forgiven too. If she can smile, I should be able to smile. Jesus, come, do something in me. Saying yes. That is the key discipline to good soil in moving. When you, when you leave today, if you wanna say yes and you want a little memento just for the rest of our journey to put it wherever you want to see it, we're gonna give you this patch. And this is not your time to get a freebie. This is if you're saying, I, A, I'm either going to say yes or I, I, I need to, I'm not sure I can, but I wanna put it near a place where I see it and I'm asked the question all the time because all of us wanna be that good soil, right? All of us does. And God has plans for you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you are with these other ones. God, God still will give. He, he will still give you opportunities. He'll, gi he'll still give you chances. But we gotta want it. We've gotta be willing to step out from the crowd. That's what Jesus is saying to us, and that's what we're doing as a church the next five weeks. We're stepping out, friends. We're not, we're not doing same old, same old. We're going, we're going further. We're going a different place. And, uh, and, 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 and we need you. We need you. Because the truth of the matter is, all the musics that are out there, all of us get to participate in it. All of us. All of us get that win, because we all contribute here in some way, shape, or form. All of us get the wins because it's a team. It's the kingdom of God and that's who we are and that's who we're a part of. Let's go, let's go. God, thank you, for, thank you for your patience and thank you for your grace. Thanks for the seed you've thrown. Keep it coming, God, we need it and we're thankful for it. Keep it coming. And we look forward to seeing what you're gonna say to us and what we're going to do. Many of us right now, we choose, I say, I don't know what it is, God, just ahead of time, I say yes. Yes, I say yes. Help us remember what we need to remember, and I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.